Now, I'm really, really happy to have next to meet you friends and amazing representatives of the VR scene. Um, and I truly mean it. Um, what, what John Berber and Justin Damiani have accomplished is truly remarkable. And I couldn't be more honored to, to be with you um, today for the third act of, uh, of walkthroughs. Uh, I will, um, let me briefly introduce them. Um, John Buke Berber is, a, is an artist that creates immersive audiovisual experiences embodied in physical and digital spaces. His products consist of experiments with their, uh, various media such as VR, AR, project mapping, large scale displays and digital fabrication. Um, uh, John is driven by an interdisciplinary thinking and curiosity that extends to the art design and science. Um, Buke Berber's work often focuses on uh, human perception, exploring new methods for uh, uh, non-linear narratives and geometrical order. Just Damiani is a, a deputy, de de deputy director of uh, emerging technology at Southern New Hampshire University, a Forbes contributor and editor at large at VR Scout. He's the curator of the XR for Change Summit, curatorial advisor at Currents New Media and curator at the forthcoming Next Museum. Uh, he curated a spatial reality exhibition of Space Gallery and co-curated virtual features with LA CMA and Sim Cinema with Float. Who is speaking? I'm George uh, Vitale. I'm a creative director and ex exhibition maker based in Berlin. My projects evolves around the role influence of technology on society through the lens of art and the eyes of the artist. In 2017, I founded Synthesis, which is um, a first of its kind VR-based experimental art gallery located in Berlin. We are driven by a uh, strong interdisciplinary approach. Therefore, pieces are displayed through different media, tangible and traditional art forms intermingle with Oculus and Vive headset. Uh, I would like to briefly give the, uh, introduce the structure of the talk and provide the audience with like a quick overview. Um, so we will start off with a presentation by John about the work um, that is today presented, but also with an overview of his body of work. After the presentation, we will have the walkthrough of John, John's piece uh, today um, that is presented today um, called Mediated Virtuality. And then we will welcome and answer any questions from the audience. Feel free to leave your questions for the panelists in the comment section um, here on Facebook. Um, I will make sure to check the, the chat regularly. And uh, I think we're all set to, to um, for the start. John, shall we begin? In here, I said uh, I'm using the software for the first time. Please excuse <laughs> us if anything goes wrong. So that was the part it went wrong. Now, <laughs> now hopefully it's going to work. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I was just briefly before I was just showing my work briefly, if you, um, our viewers are not familiar with it right now. So, um, okay. I, like George said, you, I guess you heard him. I, I'm an artist working with digital media and, uh, I create immersive installations and my work is generally uh, is an exploration and experiments within the intersection of art and technology and design. And uh, I tend to use different technologies to create different types of um, audiovisual immersive experiences. So sometimes I use um, projection tools on architecture. Sometimes I work with uh, geodesic domes. I create 360 experiences sometimes. I can use same kind of experiences inside the VR. And uh, I'm always intrigued by new technologies like AR, VR, and all sorts of uh, like digital fabrication and sensors. So, uh, and also I like generating forms and um, inspired by nature, physics, uh, higher dimensional geometries, um, and I like bringing those forms into uh, different spaces and media. So in, in general, uh, I think my work um, is, is, an, is an experiment exploring the intersection between um, different spaces. So in, in, in general, this virtual space and physical space analogy works 
uh, well, uh, literally, and also if we think about our uh, internal experiences and external experiences, or or um, um, the computer world and the physical world, or our dreams and fantasies, and you know our mindscape and the uh, the physical, tangible, three D reality. So I'm I'm trying to bring artifacts from each world to the other. So a physical experimentation can influence a digital asset, or I can try to bring a digital uh, entity into our 3D space using 3D printers, or I can externalize my internal experiences like uh, my dreams or um, out of sometimes um, out of body experiences or, or um, you know, different, different types of uh, different states of consciousness. So uh, that's, that's like the general um, what I do. So I'm going to try to jump into the other uh, selection of photos from the work I'm going to talk about today. Um, just a second. Window capture photos. Okay, I think you guys can see it now, right? We still uh, see you, John. You might need to do a separate screen share. Transition. Do you, do you see domes and virtual reality? Uh, no? Domes, yes. Yeah, yeah I see. It. Okay, it updated. Okay. So, yeah, this, this is just a small, uh, a few slides from my keynote. Uh, talking about how I've, I've started working with domes and virtual reality. So um, let's see. Hope it works. Um, so this this is Biosphere in Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada. And the, the can you see it now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so th this was back in 2015. Um, I, I visited uh, Montreal uh, for a um, performance at SAT, a Society for Art and Technology. Uh, they have these um, immersion and experience symposiums each year. And it's a very vibrant environment where all sorts of uh, artists and designers and uh, scholars from um, immersive media uh, get together here and they showcase their experimental pieces and talk about new technologies. So I was there um, and um, I was <clears throat> super intrigued by their permanent dome installation over there. It uses, I guess, 12 or 16 uh, permanently installed projectors. So it's kind of like a VR experience, but it's a communal experience where everybody can enter to that uh, virtual space. It's an amazing environment and Biosphere uh, in Montreal was built by architect Buckminster Fuller, who influenced me big time. I'm a big admirer of his ideas. And we see here uh, Allegra Fuller, his daughter, who is also a scholar. And that day, uh, during the opening of Immersion Experience Symposium, she was talking about her father and how he came up with the idea of geodesic domes uh, inspired by carbon atoms and then uh, his ideas of uh, synergy and spaceship earth and all these uh, amazing concepts and it, it was a super inspiring moment for me we were within this within this dome structure and i was just imagining it like a kinetic sculpture you know moving and uh, doing uh, these uh, in, impossible uh, uh, movements basically so i was super intrigued by it and uh, that was a time I moved to the U.S. for my master studies at SFAI San Francisco uh, Art Institute. Uh, so I, uh, creating an immersive piece for domes and virtual reality was uh, something I had in mind. Um, I was more exploring about a topic, and uh, this book from uh, 70s, 70s, 
um, by media theorist Gene Youngblood became a big another uh, like re resource material for me. Strangely, it was also uh, the foreword was by Buckminster Fuller himself. And uh, in this book, Gene Youngblood literally prophesizing the world we are living in right now, how the future of uh, cinema is going to be more sensory experiences and less about drama and narratives, but more of uh, a synergetic form, uh, a, a mix, um, new media between music and abstract visuals and technology. He was uh, talking about holography and uh, how the future of audiovisual experiences will be more immersive and uh, surrounding and so on. So uh, it was a super inspiring book. So the first piece that I've created for domes and virtual reality inspired by all this material and uh, Buckminster Fuller and Gene Youngblood was uh, this piece called Morphogenesis, uh, which uh, consists of uh, different abstract uh, spaces uh, inspired by how organisms develop their shape by following certain geometrical principles and we can see those geometrical principles in nature in micro scales or macro scales so this was my attempt to uh, visualize that processes and build build um, build an experience by um, flying through these different immersive spaces and different um, audio audio environments as well. Um, so th th one cool thing about this was something I discovered um, before these kind of experiences. I was doing more site-specific architectural installations and you're working for three months, four months for a single experience and after the screening is done you can't really show that piece again because it is specifically generated for that piece of architecture. But with domes and VR, uh, I've been exploring uh, as this new media. I was able to just send these pieces all over the world and screen it in different places at the same time. If they don't have a dome, I can send these, uh, you know, uh, VR content and they can showcase it. Or um, I, I also use these kind of uh, panoramic uh, displays. This is literally the tiled content of that 360 um, visual, which is called equi-rectangular. So in a single uh, frame, you have all 360 angles and uh, it basically wraps around a sphere and you see that either in VR or uh, dome, it's the same thing. So it was super inspiring to get feedback from this experience and I'm gonna play a small one minute uh, teaser from it. Okay, so um, this I did this during my first year of my grad studies and it received a really well uh, feedback and I was also exploring the whole vibrant VR scene in California and I guess that's where I meet Jesse as well. Um, th there is a lot going on and there, there, there was a big hype around VR um, and I, I remember I attended this uh, Vision Summit in 2016 and HTC just gave us all these VR headsets for free and we received it you know before it was released to public and so I I, sh I, I must I, I said I must do something for 
uh, this uh, interactive uh, VR uh, headset. And then and this is the second year of my grad studies and my, this is kind of like my grad show piece as well. And my intention, um, and I was invited to this uh, amazing artist residency at uh, Autodesk's Pier 9 workshop. Uh, it is a it is a digital fabrication uh, facility and they provide artists software workshops uh, you know classes for these machinery and software they have and they have amazing uh, 3d printers CNC machinery laser cutters uh, wood workshop you know a metal workshop so it's like a dream uh, workshop environment basically for artists like us uh, and you can literally build a car or a tank in that workshop you know and they are just expecting us to build uh, to experiment with their uh, tools over there and I was completely free to do whatever I want within that uh, three four months and uh, this so this was a great opportunity to build my uh, new piece basically um, so this is a room from uh, San Francisco Mints where SFAI had their grad exhibition in. I had this uh, beautiful room um, and I my intention was exploring more deeply how the, the relationship between physical and digital space and I was intending to build a physical installation basically map the room inside the VR place the same sculptures uh, inside the VR as well and allow people to uh, have an experience in between these physical uh, the real in be between um, reality virtuality continue basically um, I was inspired by uh, bringing a new way to showcase VR pieces in gallery setting because most of the time uh, the headset, the tech is highlighted, but we have no idea about what's going on inside the experience. And also, because most of the time just a single person can experience the VR piece, uh, there's a long line, people are waiting, sometimes losing their interest to experience the piece. So uh, my intention was to start the experience before they're in VR and uh, enjoy the gallery space, the prints, the sculptures and everything and the sound as well. Uh, but when they're within VR with the headset, they are having an enhanced experience of the space. So uh, I began to, inspired by that morphogenesis process, I began to create different sculptural ideas and uh, you know what kind of physicality I, I can bring to VR. And, and at the same time, uh, HTC again announced their uh, vibe, uh, vibe trackers. So this was another cool piece of equipment that I wanted to use uh, because um, I'm, I, I wanted to bring physicality, I, I want to bring physical interaction and uh, I don't want to just stuck, uh, I, I don't want to be limited by the use of controllers. And this was a great way to just put uh, any object into VR and have them tracked inside the virtual space. So these are some of the sculptures that I produced. Um, you see, uh, you know, a mix between organic shapes and uh, what I say, uh, transcendental objects. So I was acting like I'm bringing these higher dimensional objects to our 3D reality. You know, uh, it's something impossible. You can't really, com we can't really comprehend how the four dimensional space works, but there are some projections in 2D and 3D space. And I was inspired by those geometries and also the cool, uh, you know, connection uh, between, you know, bringing something from fourth to third dimension and also bringing something from virtual to uh, physical. And also again, uh, interacting with that physical but it triggers the uh, VR experience as well so it was a literal combination of all these like uh, clashing uh, realities or spaces uh, so this is how it looked like um, I, I had this table in the room um, I, I placed all my um, sculptural objects on that table and the VR headset as well 
And I also had uh, several different uh, prints on the walls. So it was already like a, you know, gallery experience without the VR. And I also used um, projection mapping on these prints. And, you know, there was this sound piece and uh, the other uh, objects as well. Um, and then I mapped this whole room in VR with, with the exact same dimensions. I placed the objects at the exact uh, right places, you know, all these sculptures. And also these three, two d prints on the walls, they are, uh, you know, 3D rendering. So I already had the 3D assets of these pieces and I placed them in three dimensions uh, into the VR space as well. Actually, now I'm thinking like this, this could be a better AR experience, you know, without all the uh, fuss about the VR stuff. But uh, at the time, uh, it wasn't that popular yet. So that, that these are the tools that I had. Um, another, another thing also, I realized um, while you are interacting with the, you know, sculptures, if you don't see your hands, some sort of interaction is still missing and I use leap motion sensor for that where we can just see our hands in the VR as well so it somehow completed the experience and uh, it was a it, it was a lot of people's first time in VR and uh, you know there is already a wow factor just putting a headset on but as they had this also physical interaction with the space as well you know, it, it was a really uh, interesting, rich sensory uh, experience for them. Now they, now I can see it. Yeah, you can see. Me. Okay, so uh, so unfortunately, guys, this this is a pretty old build, and because I have all these, you know, um, stuff for the equipment. I wasn't really able to update everything, so it kind of works weird. It's not exactly the way it looked back then, but uh, you can see here all those same sculptures, uh, like the physical space, and also I've, I've placed these uh, 3D versions of the prints you've seen onto the environment. and. What I've added to this, 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 this is more like a research piece for me. You know, this is not like my other uh, audiovisual work where you have this, you know, twenty-minute experience. But uh, I was uh, keeping in mind a lot of people are gonna experience this in this space, so I wanted to give them a brief, um, you know, experience in VR. Uh, in addition to their physical experience in the gallery space as well. So what I did was, uh, so you enter this room and uh, these um, wire, this wireframe you see here is the exact uh, dimensions of the room you're inside. And I just wanted to present them an enhanced virtual version of the room they're physically in. And the weird thing, you know, uh, people were interacting more with the table because it's a larger object. So they were going beneath it and touching it. It, it was just such a weird experience. They are like newborns in this virtual space, you know. And and I wanted to bring some sort of uh, out of body experience into this. So what I did was, Jim, yeah. Can I can I ask you a, friend, a question? For sure. Because I think. Yeah. Uh, you, you are going to talk about this, but I think it's. Uh, um, what, can you describe the process of actually how you moved from uh, you, you, from like three D printed sculptures to a spatial installation that activates the VR? Like, sure. You know, how, yeah. So the process starts with the creation of the sculptures. Basically, uh, I use different softwares for that. Um, would you like me to talk about that software process or more? The conceptual well, if you could like yeah, just briefly uh, talk about it yes sure um so basically there's a lot of form experiments so i'm uh, the the first step i'm more like a sculptor I, I come up with the forms and i i have the higher resolution 3d mesh uh that i 3d print so the ones that i brought into unity here are lower uh density versions of that um 
And then, um, basically, I brought all the sculptures that I have 3D printed inside the Unity and I placed them in the, uh, you know, exact same locations. Uh, there are a f there, there were two different um, sculptures with the vibe trackers that you can interact with. So these are the ones you can actually hold and uh, basically it works at the same, uh, you know, uh, space. Uh, the, the the physical and the uh, virtual is the same experience but uh, w what I've added to this enhancement was adding this slight elevation you know uh, to the ceiling and I've placed a much larger a more, uh, version of the same sculpture people were holding like a space or like a it's kind of like a you're kidnapped by a UFO or something like that. <laughs> I just wanted to add a very simple uh, um, out of body experience and people were kind of freaking out because they weren't expecting, you know, they were interacting with a table and sculptures and they still feel like uh, it's kind of like a video effect or something. They don't, everybody doesn't really recognize this is a, they, they're fully inside the VR because it looks so similar to their physical experience as well so they thought oh this is just kind of an effect or something but when i started to elevate them into the ceiling inside this form you know it, it was a completely different uh, experience especially for the people who were using the vr for the first time um so let me just d dive into the vr right now Okay. How how is the frame rate, by the way, guys? Ah, oh, it's pretty good. Is, it's is it pretty good? good. I'm checking. Yeah, I'm checking regularly Facebook. It's actually very good. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, in my in my work, I have this more, you know, vector vector like aesthetics, which is not you know which is very abstract and not super realistically rendered, but more like a graphical, you know. Um, it has more like a graphic aesthetic, graphical aesthetic like this. So uh, I, I did that in here as well. Um, because I don't have the actual table right now, I, I'm just able to show you guys like this. I can get nearby and, and, and my hands are here as well. And Leap Motion does an amazing job for this kind of thing. So I'm, I'm actually holding the, can you see my camera as well? I'm actually holding the piece right now, but I can't Yeah, see. yeah, we can see both. I, I can guess see it is turned off when you try it. <laughs> so I'm turning this on right now. And I need to pair it. Oops, I accidentally started the game here. <laughs> okay, done. Let's try it again. Wow, the track, the tracker is here, but the sculpture is not. But I guess you get the idea. So basically, we can see it. We can see it again. Yeah. 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 So the, these forms, John, if I could, yeah. if I could jump in, yes, please, um, because I think you're you're at a spot um, that I think is sort of a really salient jumping off point. Because um, one thing that I just continually appreciate about your practice is this like totally converged, uh, intersectional, but in terms of the the technologies and and the arts um, approach to what these things can be. Um, so I'm wondering when you've shown people this, what have they what have their responses been um, in merging this, you know, physical world with digital realities, or putting people in realities that have some bearing in the reality that mm -hmm. they're in, but then have this abstract geometric, you know, sky and, you know, alien sort of lighting system? How have people responded to that? Um, 
so you know it's 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 always a different experience in different locations so it depends on the you know ex exhibiting environment just a second i'm trying to find you guys yes so uh, for instance at, at the sfai grad show i think this was the most you know out there technological piece because we <laughs> have more like performance artists and sculptors and you know classic painter friends so uh, it was more like a contemporary art show uh, in which where they see this super weird uh, technologically advanced thing for the first time so <laughs> it was a complete alien experience for a lot of the audiences you know but uh, mm. not not just the aesthetics or the sculptures when they enter to this vr space it is a completely different experience too because for a lot of people uh, like i said if you if they never experience vr there is still a wow factor but most of the time uh, they are trying to understand like what is really going on here you know am i looking because <laughs> their hands over there as well you know they see the same yeah, table yeah. so uh, for instance they taught if if i move the table is it gonna move here as well because they didn't know the <laughs> uh, difference between that vr setup and the physical setup so uh, but I, I guess because there is all these things that you can't really analyze at the moment there is this mind-blowing effect of wow i'm experiencing th th this is i mean the special thing for me was giving people an experience you know, for the first time in their life, that, that is something you can't really do in, in our time <laughs> anymore, you know, because <laughs> uh, totally. so th th that was really, that was really fulfilling. Another thing that I really, uh, totally. and I, a feedback I received and it inspired my, uh, you know, following work. Um, they, they, they found themselves in sort of meditative, spaces you know because it, it is a mm. lot like a psychedelic experience as well so the surprising thing for me after just having a few minutes of these uh you know technological experience the next moment when they come outside of vr we are in deep conversations about the nature of reality <laughs> and how the mind works and consciousness expansion and all that topics you know so it it, it, it is really fun and fulfilling to have those kind of feedback immediately, but not after like a, an hour of conversation, you know? <laughs> totally. Well, one thing that's so funny is your work is so precise, but you're kind of a far out dude, like even coming in on this discussion with expanded cinema, like that comes from the counterculture of the seventies. Exactly. Um, I'm wondering in doing this work and making this work, and you referenced like the fourth dimension while we were sort of, while you were doing your walkthrough, have you noticed that making this work has changed how you think or per space or, you know, embody the artistic potential of space? I mean, definitely, definitely. Because, you know, we are visual creatures and uh, just like machine learning algorithms, we learn uh, from the memories or visual experiences we have. And somehow our minds are sorting all these different experiences and something we were talking about with my friend uh you see these sort of experiences more in your dreams after you experience this kind of vr stuff because now it is encoded in your memory as well and you have this example visual space so when your mind generates dream spaces they are inspired by vr experiences so it is a complete you know <laughs> mind blower <laughs> to to notice that totally. kind of stuff and also, I mean, the more time you spend in VR, especially when you're developing, not just experience the experience, but when you're developing, you're tweaking a lot of the stuff. And I'm, and I'm sure it happens to all these people, like all sorts of people who works with VR. When you come back to physical reality, it kind of feels like a VR experience as well, because, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we have a gyro in our, you know, brain and the, in, in, or in, in inner ear, whatever. Uh, we have these two sensory organs. It, you know, it generates the same way the a, a computer uh, graphics card generates the virtual spaces. So it, it, it oh, changes right. how you look at work. Totally. Totally. I saw, I'm not sure if you saw this, but um, Nick Madison a few months ago posted a video that went viral of uh, him and his quest. He had basically mapped his lived environment onto his quest. Did you see this video? I, I've seen it, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, 
reminds me a lot of your work. And I just wonder, like, do you, are you thinking about the ways, particularly with the pandemic, how your sort of sense of merging the physical and the digital might change how we relate to like our, our interior spaces, our like our intimate, you know, our rooms, our offices, our homes? Uh, I mean, totally. This, this is something we were discuss, discussing earlier together, guys. Um, you know, all the people who are working in this field are always sharing their future future projections about how the like is going to be with these technologies. <laughs> but like we were talking about maybe in 30, you know, twenty thirties or whatever, but suddenly this pandemic happens and we can't literally go outside and all the communication tools, all the, you know, projects we're doing, social interactions, everything is performed in the uh, virtual space. So uh, we really need in this type of setting, the spatial interaction and uh, display technologies because we can't, I mean, Zoom for the moment is fine. We can see our, you know, uh, facial gestures and expressions and we can hear ourselves with mics, but we are totally missing much bigger physical presence and uh, you know how how our physical presence and all our gestures and body language also transmits much more information than our facial gestures. I think we need it totally. now more than ever. I, I I guess this is gonna even more justify the need for these type of immersive media. John, totally. if I, sorry. Like according to what you just said, do you believe in the future? Like you know there will be let's see. Uh, sort of like an increase in the unification between virtual and real spaces in light of what you just said and yeah i mean that's that's what everybody says in the field right now because uh these are i mean not just the vr and ar part of our reality but you know these devices are everyday uh component right now we really need these devices but the interaction between that information system uh between our brain and the system is just this 2d display but these new technologies and gaming engines and vr and ar mixed reality uh technologies are enabling the spatial uh computing so the exactly the way we interact with our physical spaces so i think it seems to me inevitable the mer mer inevitable. merging of those two spaces and if I can ask you again, um, you know, if if we've seen that in like through through throughout your body of work, there is something that is uh, you know um, that is present, which is this like how you engage with like architecture and space. Um, you have worked as we've seen like with domes and spatial installations. I was just wondering where this fascination for uh, immersive experiences comes from, because um, you know I've been talking like as a as someone who runs a VR gallery. I mean, I, I talk to, uh, to to artists, and every time I, I get a different, I get different answer. So I'm actually curious, where does this fascination for like architecture and space and you know come from? Mm -hmm. um, I think it definitely comes from. Um, so I'm going to explain this, but I'm just trying to uh, tweak this uh, OBS setup right now, so we can have more visual in the background. Sorry. <laughs> Or maybe I can just make this full screen now, the Zoom setup, so we can talk more freely. Okay, I think it's gonna work now. Transition. So we should be full screen now. So, uh, the. Yeah, that's a great question for sure. Uh, I, I, I was always fascinated with uh, cinema uh, and, I, and I was an aspiring director. Um, and during my uh, design uh, studies in uh, undergrad, uh, I studied visual communication design. And that was the first time we were, I, I, I started uh, exhibiting my digital pieces. So projectors came first and putting the projectors in gallery and uh, the 3D animation and motion picture and abstract forms uh, displayed in spaces became something to consider about, you know. And at the time, uh, projection mapping uh, was really booming all around the world, especially in, in Europe, in, you know, light festivals and 
projection map mapping festivals, a lot of uh, architectural installations were uh, becoming uh, available for artists like me. I remember the first time I actually did my first projection mapping uh, exhibition in Cologne in Germany. Uh, and I, I mapped a simple uh, chair and uh, I, I actually mapped it it's uh, shadow and shadow was duplicating and making all these you know uh, different stuff so w once i did that it just you just get the idea of oh like there are infinite possibilities here you know you can bring anything uh, from digital world on physical world using this technology and then uh, you know one wall and three walls and you know architectural facades. It just and, and I did some uh, anaglyph three D work as well on the architecture. But it, despite the installations were huge and you know architectural, it wasn't still uh, really immersing you. You know, the, so when when I experienced a dome environment for the first time, I knew this was the ultimate tool to create immersive experiences and then vr came hand to hand with you know dome uh, content creation yeah it's sort of like um domes allow you to really share in the immersive experience um but often lack the interactivity and intimacy um of what you get in headsets one thing that i that i want to pick up on in there is um like when you're talking about this chair, I was thinking about one thing that you do that I really like is you bring a really organic touch to sort of be, all of your work that I've encountered, there's something organic about it, even though it's decidedly digital. Um, so I feel like there's an assumption that like the digital cannot be natural. And I'm thinking about dome environments and projections that sort of make you feel more somehow involved in the natural world how are you thinking about and like in what ways can can immersive arts can the immersive arts um bring us a sense of the natural and the organic yeah yeah it's a great question i think it's about the materiality of the digital media because what, what, what for instance if a sculptor works with wood that is your material and you utilize what a wood can or can't you know or when you're working <laughs> metal you're bringing that uh, tangible material qualities into the work itself and i think um when the computer graphics first came about you know we were trying to imitate photorealistic imagery like Jurassic Park and dinosaurs and cars and all that kind of realistic stuff. But I think over time, uh, when people who are working with computer graphics find their own, you know, uh, free independent environment, uh, they begin to experiment with the digital material itself. And I think the, you know, low poly uh, aesthetics and <laughs> particles and, you know, different ways of shading things. It just created its own aesthetics, which I really find beautiful. Uh, and also, if you just look at it from a um, minimum, yeah, you know, abstraction and minimalism point as well, how you can really generate something out of nothing within the with the minimum amount of things you can, you know. Uh, so a, 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 a pyramid is the uh, you know the simplest shape that can exist in, in in three dimensions so i think it starts from there and builds its own aesthetics but uh, also now with you know uh 3d scanning and scanning you know nature we can really bring like with photogrammetry and stuff like that we can bring more influence from nature itself and it, it and i think it captures an amazing complexity but we can still add this digital touch. So I, th I feel like, uh, you know, as, as all these communications are happening more and more in virtual spaces, we are generating this whole new world. And, and I think it gives us uh, artists and designers a chance to uh, decide or experiment, explore how this reality is going to look like, because it's obvious that we don't have to duplicate the way things look like in the real world, but we can just mm. free, free our imaginations and uh, be the architects of this new, you know, environment. Boom. I love that quote. All right. I'm going to throw one more question to, sorry, to you and then, and then probably send it over to the audience. Oh, 
What's that? Just uh, just one second. I just wanted uh, to remind everyone to, if you have uh, you know any questions for for us for the panelists, please feel free to drop it in the comment section on Facebook. I'm checking it regularly. Uh, yes, sorry about that. All good. Um, yeah, lots of John has lots of great things to share. So definitely everybody watching live, um, this is a good chance. Uh, my final my final question for you is just more tactical, kind of based on what you were saying um, just a second ago, where um, we have all these new tools now, and it's often hard for artists to kind of determine what tool to use to, um, to, to portray whatever this sort of concept that, that is sort of itching and burning at you. Um, how, you've done a really good job, John, translating across, you know, from dome to VR, but also in between to equirectangular, you know, both projection maps, but then also just sort of looped video um, and drawing people in and across sort of the board. Um, how do you how do you think about doing that and how might you help? Like, what is some advice you could give to, to other artists who are thinking, I'd really love to make something, but there's a pretty small install base for VR, and I'd love to kind of put my time into making something that can live, you know, across the, you know, deployments of dome, VR headset, projection map, what have you. Yeah, I mean, something I, I feel like, uh, you know, there are usually two types of people. Some people are super advanced with, you know, dealing with computers and softwares and, you know, coding and the, the tech side of things. And there are people who are maybe more removed from that world and likes tangible stuff and, you know, painting, sculpting, um, you know, all, all the traditional art making tools. Uh, I feel like, I mean, my perspective totally changed when I moved to San Fran and start to work <laughs> within a workshop environment, you know, and I feel like mm. my digital art even more improved after I started to work with real materials because there is something like literally real there, you know, that it doesn't exist in the <laughs> virtual world and we can learn a lot from it because it's a rich sensory experience, right? Because you hold stuff, you feel it and there's a lot of juice in there, in, in that experience. And I think there's a lot we can bring into the digital space from those experiences. So I, uh, I, I really value the you know, if you want to do something with a computer, start doing it without a computer first, you know, you don't, uh, because mm. a lot of the times, especially the first group of people I mentioned, the more techie people, they got caught up in those like softwares or, you know, sensors or updates or the newest tool and the next big thing, you know, whatever <laughs> that, that kind of, uh, and I, and I think it, it just damages the flow of the, you know, creative process. But I feel like an idea can really start in your head and then it can, you can translate it into drawings and sketches. And then, and, and once you, you know what you're talking about, what you want to show, what's the experience like, what, what do you want people to feel, then it is a digital translation process. And, and I feel mm. like with, with, you know, new, um, like gaming engines like Unity and Unreal, I mean, these are free software, you can just download it and use and there is like infinite amount of tutorials online that people can find, which wasn't really available when we were kids, you know, these were super expensive software and there were no internet, you know, <laughs> and, mm. and, and I feel like uh, they can just start, like I said, with, with the traditional ways of creativity and start to find ways to translate it into digital space. Mm. So literally like picking up, objects or sketching something out um, or even just talking something through, putting in a Google doc, like that type of stuff. Exactly. Because, you know, uh, you're creating something from nothing and you need something, you know, <laughs> and what, how is it going to look like? Uh, we, we tend to, when we're creating experiences, we tend to uh, mimic what we consume the most, you know, aesthetically, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know, your tree can be, different than my tree, your apple can look like uh, different from my apple, you know, uh, I, I, I really value, I, I think especially for this kind of uh, ex very, very expressive media, we can literally enhance the way you, we look, for instance, with the AR filters and stuff like that. Uh, there is a lot of personal expression we can bring into our creations. 
And I think that's that that uniqueness makes something really special, you know, not really replicating someone else's reality, but, uh, you know, like externalizing your own inner experience in a way. Mm. I think about this a lot. I'm, I'm sorry, this conversation is just so interesting to me. Um, I think a lot about like how when I'm just waking up and I'm still kind of in this hypnagogic like dream state, yeah. the things I'm thinking about are they're like images and words and something beyond. And they're both bigger and tinier than, than the real world. It's like, and the closest that I've gotten to that feeling is through VR experience. Exactly. And, I, and I'm sure this really inspired all the pioneers in this field, you know, because after you have a VR experience, you and if you're familiar with hypnagogic states, you realize it's kind of like the same thing. And you know, uh, we, we we literally have an internal render engine that works <laughs> without any without any sensory input. You know, and so for us, I mean, I love this conversation as well because it is super inspiring to me when we are dealing with all these like rich sensory experiences actually having sensory deprivation can be a super inspiring state as well so just float i, I love flotation tanks for instance uh this mm. despite your it is the invert of a vr experience it, <laughs> it really produces similar type of uh of a sensory experience where you can bring a lot of inspiration from that deprivation into this sensory overload you know totally totally George, I know we're kind of tight on time. I want to want to check in with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're definitely um, about to uh, wrap it up. Uh, again, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please drop it in the comment section. I would like to ask a uh, um, last, last question for me, for for um, for John. So, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, architecture space, um, you know, in, are intertwined in your projects with VR and you know, VR in a way like uh, allows, uh, has allowed you to, you know, fulfill all the fantasies that were limited uh, by physical reality, you know? Um, I was wondering, like, how has the process of reaching these fantasies um, evolved? Has it remained the same? What adjustments have you made? And, you know, um, how do you see this uh, going forward? Yeah, I mean, the more the more you learn about stuff it just makes you feel different about the stuff you're interested in right so mm -hmm. <laughs> like um i when i first moved to san francisco i i was like super uh like uh, how can i say uh, evangelistic about the whole technology and the future we're building with these technologies mm -hmm. because there is a lot of power you know in, in these media and in this way of creativity. And, uh, but uh, as, as I get more engaged with these tools, it kind of begins to scare you as well because it definitely enhances our abilities, you know, or we, but also it makes us question what, what is really uh, essential about the human experience and what do we want to keep how much we want to evolve because all these tools within the world of right now and you know uh, brain computer interface it's going to enable us to have these experiences like the in replacement of the real physical sensory experience we're having right now so there is a big question like how much we want to keep and how much we want to evolve and i think it's a personal preference for everyone but uh i am less excited than I feel more uh, cautious now because I think uh, imagination is more limitless when you just fantasize about stuff which can really happen but when we now know it can really happen it puts you in a different state you know um, I, we have a question from uh, from um, from the people in attendance Wendy Wendy is asking, um, you know what are what are like um, what are what are what are your upcoming projects? If you have something in the works, and of course, if you could like you know tell the audience how they can keep up with you know and uh, stay updated with your work mm -hmm. via you know website, I guess, and social media. Yeah. So um, I mean, the, after the stuff that I sh showed, you know, after these experiences, I became more interested in the med meditation side 
of this stuff because I've been receiving a lot of feedback about, you know, how calming can this be, how, you know, stress reducing qualities it has. So I spent some time actually last year working on these type of like guided meditation experiences uh, for domes with a group of people in New York. It is still going on. Um, and uh, I also built uh, another installation in New York in a space called Zero Space. It is a big uh, immersive experience um, museum in New York. So those experiences are still going on, not right now because of the pandemic, but you know they're installed over there. So people over there can experience it. Um, and also um, on my social accounts, you know, if they just type my name, they can find my pages. I usually share a lot about my process. Actually, sometimes I'm opening up, you know, my uh, creation processes as well. And I send some iterations and I receive feedback. And sometimes, I mean, it can become like a crowdsourced creative process as well. You know, I really like that. But um, I'm, I'm, I, and I also I spent some time in nature last year in Hawaii, and I was I, I was super into photography and you know just photographing landscapes and the ocean and you know uh, more photography stuff. So I think those like recent experiences are going to inform my uh, new projects that are. Uh, more inspired by those meditative state, states and photorealistic nature elements in it and uh, somewhere around those lines. Maybe removing myself a little bit more from this, you know, abstract, super computer graphic looking world into uh, something different. Um, April is asking, is, is there anything coming up in Los Angeles? In Los Angeles? Uh, yes. Not. I mean, I'm, I'm, we are talking where, about... Where Jesse is, by the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, hopefully, they, I'm in Turkey right now and the international flights are cancelled. <laughs> so when it becomes available, it, 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 it just pause a lot of the stuff that was happening. Um, but hopefully it can, probably in the new year, I suppose, you know, in 2021. All right, guys, we reached the end. Um, we made it regardless of the technical difficulties and couldn't be more like happier. Um, I wanted to thank you very, very much, uh, John, and of course, Jesse. Uh, I thank think uh, it was a very inspiring, insightful conversation. Thank you for uh, joining World Truths for Synthesis. Um, we will um, we will announce a new series of World Truths next week. So as a as I said at the beginning, uh, stay in touch via our social media um, for upcoming announcement. And uh, yeah, thank you very much again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, George. Thanks, yeah, thanks, thanks George. Thanks, John. <laughs> uh, thank you.